everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Shavuot. Getting in tune with the Elohim Philharmonic. What I'm about to tell you is a story. It's our story. It's the story of our people. It's an old story, but it's a new story. But it's an old story. Our forefathers, when they were in the land of Israel, or in the land of Egypt, enslaved, they were in tune spiritually with the rhythms and the beat of Egypt, which in the Bible is a metaphor for the world. Yehovah Elohim, with a mighty arm, led the children of Israel out and away from the world, Egypt. And he led them into the quietude of the wilderness, the silence of the wilderness, where you hear nothing. He led them out there so they could get deprogrammed. To get their brain waves and the beat and the rhythm of their lives in tune with Him. Away from the syncopation of Egypt and the rhythms and the beats of, of the world and all that it has to offer and all the things that capture the mind, the will, and the emotions. And he led them into the wilderness, the Debar, or the Midbar. The Midbar, that's the Hebrew word for wilderness. And it comes from the word Debar, which means word or speech or conversation. Yehovah in his wisdom literally led the children of Israel out of the cacophony, the confusion of Babylon and all the world in the city that Egypt was a picture of. He led them into this neutral zone, this quiet zone of the wilderness because he wanted to speak to them. He wanted to enter into conversation with them. He wanted to teach them to hear His voice. I will be your God and you will be my people. But they had to get deprogrammed. They had to tune out the noise of Egypt and tune in to the quiet, still small voice of Jehovah Elohim. The first place He led them to was Mount Sinai where although the Torah does not specifically say that he gave them his Torah, his commandments on the day of Pentecost, everything, the evidence in the scriptures and Jewish tradition seems to point to that, that that was the day. When he led them out in the quietness of the wilderness to speak to them audibly, but there was a time of preparation. They had to prepare. You just don't waltz into the... have an audience with the mighty king. Acts, Exodus chapter 19 is, is the story where they prepared. 
They washed their clothes. They didn't have any carnal relations with their spouses. They got themselves ready to hear him. They made themselves clean and set apart and disconnected from the distractions of the world out there in the wilderness and anything else that might impede one's ability to hear the voice of the Creator. And then in Acts chapter 20, Yehovah spoke to them. But they still had too much of Egypt in them. They could not hear it. They said, please, Yehovah, we don't want to hear you. They, 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 were, they, they were afraid. They had fear in them. They were still, they had too much of Egypt in them. Just like Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they were ashamed and they couldn't be in the presence of Elohim. They ran and they hid. Their lives were still in sync with the mind, the will, and the emotions, and the flesh of the, the, that was uncircumcised in them. They had too much carnality. That old worldly man has to die in the, that sterile, noise-free zone of the wilderness, away from Egypt. And as I've said so many times, they left Egypt in, a one, in one day, but it took 40 years for them to get Egypt out of them. 40 years. Some of us have been working on that for 40 years. Or 20 years. Or 10 years. Or 50 years. It's a tough one, isn't it? Nonetheless, Yehovah, Elohim, in His mercy, He gave them His Torah. His words of instructions to live by. And the Torah shows men, human beings, how to get in harmony with the Creator. Remember, we're talking about getting in tune with the Elohim's Philharmonic. Do you see, the Torah is like a tuning fork. The Torah is a tuning fork. If you're a musician, you don't, maybe don't use tuning forks anymore. When I used to sing in a church choir, the choir director would take a tuning fork out of his pocket and he'd, he'd bang it on something and he'd, he'd, he'd hear middle C or whatever and then he would get in tune. Um, those of us that have like guitars, we have, some of us, I have a guitar and it has a tuning, a tuner built into it or some of them have guitars or cl clips, you clip to it or you, you have, there's all kinds of tuning but you got to get in tune so all the musicians that we have up here can play in harmony with each other. Otherwise it's, it's confusion. Well the Torah is our tuning fork to get in harmony with Yehovah Elohim. It's his musical pitch. It represents his mind, his will, and his heart for us. And when we get in tune with that, we get out of tune with the world, the flesh, and the devil, and Egypt. You see, Israel was still in tune with Egypt. And that was evident by the fact that for the short period that Moses was up there on Mount Sinai, they fell into golden calf worship. Worship this God that they brought in their hearts from Egypt. And they mixed it with the worship of Jehovah Elohim. And they said, today, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> is a feast unto Jehovah Elohim. That was where they mixed Torah with Egypt, with the with the with the with the paganism of Egypt. Men have been doing that ever since. They, they don't want the pure word of Elohim. They want to mix it with their traditions. 
you got religions called Christianity and Rabbinic Judaism. They're mixture religions. There's good things in there, but it's they're mixed. It's mixture. And he's calling his people out of that Babylonian mixture. So Israel was more in tune with Egypt than they were with Elohim. And you know, Moses was a holy man. And when they did that, what did he do? In Exodus 33, verse 7, he couldn't even live with them. He separated himself out from the people of Israel. And he went outside the camp. He pitched his tent outside the camp. You know, Moses didn't become a, per, a holy man th that easily. He paid a great price. You see, think about it. Moses had already been through his wilderness experience 40 years previous to this. Moses had to die to himself already. He was destined to become a mighty leader and a prince in Egypt. And he fled. He fled for his life into the wilderness of Midian where he lived for 40 years as a shepherd in the backwaters of the Egyptian empire. He lost the wealth, the prestige, and the power and the position that Egypt offered him. And when Yovah he met him there at the burning bush and brought him out of the wilderness, it's quite evident that he also lost his marriage and his family. He lost it all. And sometimes that's the price that we have to pay in order to hear the voice of Elohim. And there's people in this room who have that testimony. So when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the golden calf was there, he was already way past, he'd already gotten the lure of Egypt and the attraction of Egypt out of his heart. And these people that had gone whoring after the gods of Egypt, he just had to get away. You know, spiritual leaders are often, if they're true spiritual leaders, are out a little bit ahead of the people that they're leading. Otherwise, they're not leaders. Elohim has got them in a place a little bit closer to him. If they're true leaders, they're going to be out a little bit of ahead. It's like a shepherd. He's got to be out ahead of the sheep. A good shepherd doesn't have to drive the sheep. You know, unless you have thousands of sheep in your flock. On the sheep farm I grew up on, we led the sheep. I didn't drive the sheep. We led the sheep. Sometimes I had 30 sheep or so, and I could lead them anywhere because I knew how to lead the sheep. So Moses had already gotten in tune. And he prepares his leaders ahead of time. And he prepared Moses ahead of time. Moses had paid a dear price. You know, the whole history of Israel, from the golden calf incident on, up until the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, can be described as this tension between being in sync with the vibes of the world, the harmony and the melody of the world, which I don't even think you can call it a harmony or a melody. It's like what modern classical music sounds like. It grates my ears. I can't listen to it. Or modern rock music, a lot of it, especially the real heavy stuff, gives me a headache with that beat. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of J.S. Bach. That's the kind of music I listen to. Because it's harmony. It's beautiful. It's rich. And there's rhythm, and there's melody, and there's all of those things. And it's, it, one doesn't overpower the other, and it's for the glory of Elohim. And that kind of music. This modern music, I can't even stand most, most modern Christian music. It's, it's not all of it. We, we sing some nice stuff here, but a lot of it you listen to. I, I turn on Pandora on my iPhone, and I'm listening to it, and it's a bunch of humanism. 
It's a bunch of humanism. Not all of it. Most, it's, about, it's all about me. What Jesus has done for me. It's the world. Let's just worship him. There's some in there that where they, but mostly it's what has he done for me? Jesus loves me, he has a wonderful plan for life. It's not about me. It's about him. And that's the downfall of this nation and of the Christianity. It's all about me. What's in it for me? It's called narcissism. It's called secular humanism that has invaded and taken over to a large degree Christianity. And I know David had psalms where there were, you know, where, you know, he was dealing with issues. But, and he thanked the Lord. And there's, there's a place for it. But most of it was worshiping him for who he is. And in the process of losing our lives in him, we all of a sudden, our problems get cleared up in life. When we get out of tune with our own woes, woe is me, like the, you know, and, and like, like, like pig pen in the Charlie Brown. You're always walking around with this pig pen and everybody gets sucked into your own personal pig pen. It's like just worship him and in the process, your problems get solved. It just happens. And that's what happens when we get in tune with Yehovah Elohim. And that's, that's there was the history of Israel. They were in this tension back and forth. They just could not. The Baalim, the Baals around them were drawing them in. Baal worship. And they kept, you know, Baal worship is, was the god of the Canaanites. And they kept falling into Baal worship or Ashtarah or the other ones. Kamosh and, and, and Moloch and all these other ones. And that's just literally all Baal worship is, is following the downward pull of the human nature. That's all it is. If it feels good, do it. Do what thou wilt. The ends justify the means. There's many different ways to say it. And this is what they, to a very large degree, succumb to. Instead of, you know, instead of following the upward pull to go against you know, the gravitational downward pull of the flesh and of the world and of the devil, Following the Torah means you've got to ascend to go up to Him, not just take that slippery, slide, slippery slope slide into the basement of, 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 of our base nature and follow whatever, you know, whatever we feel like doing. Following the Torah is an uphill climb. It's climbing a mountain. You don't climb a mountain to do whatever your you know, flesh feels like doing. That's just going, that's going with the flow. That's being swept downstream. So on the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, you know, the Israelites did not have a heart to serve and to worship Him because their hearts were uncircumcised. He desired that they have circumcised hearts. Uh, Moses mentions that several times in the Torah. To, I think twice in uh, twice in. Um, um, Deuteronomy, and I think once in um, do Numbers, maybe it's Leviticus, but he mentioned that he desired that they would have a circumcised heart, that they get out of tune with Egypt. Well, it wasn't until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down onto each person, and Yovah wrote his Torah on their hearts. That was the big breakthrough, that internal dynamo inside of men <coughs> to help them to walk out the Torah and to get in sync and in tune with the Torah. By the way, this is being filmed and it will be up on YouTube. Some of you are taking notes and that's fine, whatever you need to do, but it is going to be up on YouTube. And so, that was a huge breakthrough. At that point, with the help of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, as it's this dynamo, it helped us to get in tune with the Spirit of Yehovah Elohim. And to get in tune with the symphonic message of the pro-Torah pro gospel message 
which was to be taken to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, who were scattered throughout the world. Now, it's interesting to note when you stop and think about this, the whole earth, all of nature, all the universe is in sync with Yovah Elohim. All the atoms, all the molecules, all the amoebas and the, the cells, they all do what they were programmed to do. You know, the birds migrate, the butterflies, the, the, they all do what, the, what they're supposed to do at certain times. The grass grows, the clouds come, and the rains, and the, there's these cycles, and the seeds go in the ground, and then they, they sprout. <coughs> and the birds at a certain time of the year, and the squirrels and all the other animals mate, and they have babies, and they do this. They just follow, they follow nature, what Elohim is programmed to do. Everything reproduces after its kind. The sun comes up and the sun goes down. Well, really, the sun doesn't go up or come down, but you know what we mean. And, and it, it shines. It does. Everything does its thing. It makes its circuits, as it says in Psalm 19. And, and there's night and day and the lunations of the moon and all this. Only man rebels against this symphony of the creation that declares his glory. Only man is out of step. Only man. It says in Isaiah that the ox knows its master and the jackass and all of those, they know who they belong to. But man is the one that's out of sync with the heavenly conductor, the symphony of the creation. He refused to follow the instructions of the conductor of the orchestra. Man needs to repent of the sin of Torahlessness and get a new and a circumcised heart to follow Elohim. Look, the weekly Sabbaths and the biblical feasts are in harmony with the seasons. Well, especially the, not so much, the, the, let's say the feasts are. The Sabbath just follows the, 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 the cycle of the, of the sun. The weekly or the weekly cycle, and that's de determined by the rising and the setting of the sun. The feasts are determined primarily by the moons and to a less by the lunations of the moon and to a lesser degree um, by the sun. And and even the mighty oceans, uh, tides follow the moon's direction. And like musicians in an orchestra, they all follow. <coughs> Yehovah's divine instructions. Yet man lives out of harmony, out of spiritual harmony with these things. Man is, even his calendar, we call it months. But the months in our calendar don't even follow the lunations, lunations of the moon. It's a joke. Man is rebellious, arrogant, and stiff-necked, and he thinks he knows better than the Creator. But how foolish and silly man is. Really, think about it. Foolish and silly that he knows better than the Creator. Yes, the whole creation is shouting. Yes, it's screaming to us to follow the Creator. His direction, the Torah. Yet men refuse to listen because... They are in tune with Egypt and the hardness of their hearts and the pride and the rebellion. <coughs> Psalm 19, I believe, kind of says it, says it all. It starts out by saying that the heavens declare the glory of Elohim. From one end of the earth to the other, like as the sun's rays go out, as the sun's rays go out, and the sun is a picture. We don't worship the sun, obviously. But the sun is a picture of Yeshua, the great light that shines the light of his truth in the day. Malachi picked up on that in Malachi 4.2, where he, Yeshua is referred to as the son of righteousness, S-U-N. And he's going to be the sun who shines in the New Jerusalem, there in, at the end of in Je, Re, Revelation 21 and 22. And just like, and Yeshua's face shines like the sun. There, the re, there's a re, revelation of him or a vision of him in, in uh, re, Revelation chapter 1 that John saw. So the sun shines and, and, and eliminates the darkness, just like the truth of Elohim eliminates the darkness. And the sun has the ability to purify and to cleanse. And it removes the darkness. 
Well, Yeshua is the living Torah. He's a son of righteousness. And he brings, he has healing in his wings, his kanaf, Malachi 4.2. And he comes and he brings healing to those that, that, are, um, that are, have troubled souls. And he's like, he, he's a spiritual light of the world, as John says in John 1, verses 7 and nine, through 9. And, and again, Yeshua declares that about himself in, in uh, John 8, uh, 12. And the Torah is the spiritual light that brings us to Yehovah. And as I said, puts us in harmony with Yehovah, our Elohim. And Psalm 19 says it all. Let me go through the list here, starting in Psalm 19, verse 7. It says there, David says, Yehovah's Torah is perfect. The word perfect there means complete, sound, entire, wholesome, innocent, or having integrity. So the Torah is perfect, converting the soul. Continuing then, the next, the same verse, the Torah is pure, making simple the wise so, uh, making the simple wise. I'm just going down the list here of Psalm 19. We could probably st stop and park at each one of these points and get, get a whole wealth of, of meaning and significance out of each one. The Torah is pure, enlightening the eyes. Verse 8. The fear of Yehovah, which is, is, which, which is learned, through the Torah, learned through Torah obedience, is clean and endures forever. Verse 9. The judgments of Yehovah, which are based on the Torah, are true and righteous and more precious and desired than gold and sweeter than honey. Psalm 19, verse 10. <coughs> the Torah warns us of danger. Psalm 19, verse 11. There are rewards and benefits to following the Torah. Psalm 19, verse 11. Obeying the Torah keeps the, us from error and secret faults and presumptuous sin and keeps us blameless and innocent and from great transgression. Psalm 19, 12 through 13. The Torah keeps the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts acceptable in Jehovah's sight. The Torah is our strength and points us to our Redeemer, Yeshua, the living Torah, through whose example and inner strength of His Spirit, we can walk in the ways of His Torah. Verse 14. These are all the benefits of the Torah. There's a, everything you need in your life is there. Everything to get in tune with Yehovah, to get to, to, to go, to live a fruitful, blessed life, it's all there in Psalm 19. In the, all the things we just said. So being in harmony with Yehovah's Torah, both his written Torah, which is really the whole Bible, but specifically the books of Moses, and being in tune with the living Torah word, which is Yeshua, the Word of God, the Son of God incarnate, the living Torah, puts you in Yehovah's spiritual river of life. That's the sweet spot where he, where he desires for each of us to be, where we're in harmony and in tune and in sync with Him. That's when the orchestra all comes together and is playing the same tune. It's at this sweet spot where he will meet his people with life and life more abundantly, as Yeshua said. He came to bring life and life more abundantly. And it's at this place, at this place, that the spirit and the truth, Yeshua talked about the spirit and truth, to the woman at the well in John chapter 4. The Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth. John 4, 23-24. That's something the Father greatly desires. At this place is where spirit and truth meet and sync up and mesh together. And that's when stuff happens. Synergism takes place. When the truth of Yehovah's Torah commandments 
combined with his Holy Spirit, his Ruach HaKodesh, the letter of the law comes alive and brings life. 2 Corinthians 3, 6 and Colossians 1, 6. Grace meets truth and truth is made alive in love. Ephesians 4, 15. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James 2, 13. And we need mercy, His mercy to triumph over His judgment against our sin. We all need that in our lives every day. Amen? When Spirit and truth meet. The word of Elohim is proclaimed in power and authority, thus confounding the wise of the world. That's what happened when Yeshua preached the gospel and the religious people of his day said, man, we haven't heard anybody speak like that before. He speaks like one with power and authority, not like these religious dudes over here. Yeah. That, that can be ours. When spirit and truth come together, the ministries of Moses and Elijah go forth across the earth together. The Torah and the prophets. The spirit and the letter come together and pew, like a bolt of lightning, like a laser beam going out there, cutting and piercing the darkness. The Old and the New Testaments come together in perfect harmony with each other when spirit and truth meet. They're not in opposition to each other as many people have erroneously have been led to believe in, the, in Babylonian religion. When the spirit and truth together, Judah stops tripping over the living Torah and Ephraim stops stumbling over the written Torah, Isaiah 8.14. The two houses of Israel are reunited as the written Torah of the Jews combines with Yeshua, the living Torah of the Christians. Hallelujah. And so a lot of you are beginning to learn what that's like. And the Bible's coming alive to you like it never has. When spirit and truth meet together, the written and the living Torahs combine to form the full picture of Yehovah's plan of salvation. When spirit and truth come together in that day, Judah and Ephraim will say, Come, let us... Return to Jehovah, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, or after 2,000 years, he will revive us, and on the third day he will rise, raise us up together, speaking of Yeshua, the resurrection at Yeshua's second coming, that we may live in his sight. Let us pursue the knowledge of Jehovah. He will come to us like like rain, like the latter, and the former rain. End quote. Hosea 6, 1 through 3. That's a prophecy about what's happened to our people and what's happened and what's going to happen when Yeshua comes back. That's what happens when spirit and truth meet. When spirit and truth meet in that day together, Jude and Ephraim will say, Elohim is our salvation. Literally, the, that's from Isaiah 12. The word there is your, for salvation is the, is the Hebrew word Yeshua. They will come together and they will say, Elohim is our Yeshua. That's one of the scriptures that confirms there the deity in the Old Testament or the Tanakh, the deity of Yeshua. Yet Elohim is our Yeshua. Yehovah is my strength and song and has become my salvation or my Yeshua. Another proof of the deity of Yeshua. Therefore with joy they will draw water from the wells of salvation. Yeshua. Three times there. Yeshua is our Savior and Yeshua is our Elohim. Hallelujah. Don't let anybody... Don't, don't let anybody talk you out of the deity of Yeshua. That's a pit of hell. That's a lie of the devil. It gets a lot of people shipwrecked spiritually. And finally, when spirit and truth come together, the two hours of Israel will be joined. They will be joined. The two sticks will be made one. The stick of Judah and his companions and Joseph and the stick of Ephraim and his companions will become one in the hand of Yehovah Elohim. As, as, as it 
as Ezekiel 37, the prophecy says there. Together the children of Israel and the children of Judah will come weeping and seeking Yehovah. Yeshua, their Elohim, and the way to Zion, they will say, Come, let us join ourselves to Yehovah in a perpetual covenant that will not be forgotten. Jeremiah 50, verse 4 and 5. You see, the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 was a partial, in there in the upper room, was a partial fulfillment of these prophecies. It was the beginning. It's, it, hasn't, it hasn't been fully fulfilled yet. That will happen when Yeshua comes back. When this happens, but, but there on the day of Pentecost, as, as people came together in sync with each other and with the Holy Spirit, what happened? They came together in one accord. They came together in harmony. And what happened? Heaven and earth met together in that upper room. And miraculous things happened. Signs and wonders and spiritual breakthroughs. Repentance, salvation, baptisms, and spiritual empowerment are the natural result when people follow the Torah, get out of sync with Egypt and all the rudiments of the world and get in harmony with Yehovah Elohim and come together as we are doing right now and other people are doing elsewhere around the world today and tomorrow. And that, that's what happened there in the upper room. Yes, this, this is a picture of the tree of life, the river of life. This is what happens when men repent of their sins, of the sin of Torahlessness, and return to Yehovah Elohim. Doing this puts us in sync with the entire, with Yehovah Elohim and the entire universe and the whole creation. Remember what happened to ancient Israel when they got out of sync with Elohim. Even the land of Israel rose up against them. It didn't rain in its season. When they didn't keep his Sabbaths, his land Sabbaths and all the rest of them, everything was a mess. Their enemies rose up against them and there was famine, there was droughts, there were all kinds of things. But when they were in sync with him and following his Torah, the land, I mean, the, the land bore. When they came to the sixth year, they had, a, and it was, it, it, they had a double portion that year. So in the seventh year, the Shemitah year, they were able to rest. And if it was, if it was a Shemitah and a Jubilee, they had three years. In one year, the land produced enough abundance for three years. How would you like to have your job or your business so blessed in one year that you wouldn't have to work for three years? How would you like to have your business so blessed or your income so blessed that every seven years you could take a year off and you didn't have to plant your, harvest, your crops or go to, go to work? Look, I, I own a business, but I can't say that I'm living in that kind of abundance. There's higher levels that we need to attain to. So when they came together in the upper room, it was a powerful thing that happened there. And we want to be in sync with Yehovah Elohim. This, when this happens, this is the marriage of Yehovah Elohim with His people. This is the marriage of Yehovah Elohim with His people. This is the two becoming one. And we got a picture of the, the chuppah, or we got the, the chuppah here, which is a picture. That's when Yehovah Elohim married His people there at Mount Sinai, on, most likely on the day of Pentecost. It's a picture of this. The two becoming one. One flesh, one covenant, one spirit, one Torah, one family, one, you know, all of that. It's oneness, it's unity, it's harmony, together and in one accord. That's what was happening on the day of Pentecost. Heaven and earth met. The, the bridegroom and the bride coming together. 
Yes, this is redeemed Israel who has a circumcised heart and the Torah law is written on their hearts and they love him and they show their love and adoration for him by keeping his commandments. These are the robes of righteousness. These are the wedding robes of righteousness that the bride needs to be putting on herself. And we see that in Revelation 19, 7 through 8. Yes, Yehovah Yeshua, our Lord, is knocking on the doors of our spiritual houses to wake us up from the slumber of our lukewarmness, as Revelation chapter 3 says. He's walking, knocking on your, the door of your heart and the door of my heart. That's what Revelation 3, to the latest scenes, is talking about. It's not talking about the people out there in the world who've never heard the gospel. It's talking about his people that went to sleep spiritually. Where is the promise of his coming? All things continue as they have from the beginning of the age. As it says in, what was that, 2 Peter 3? or four, somewhere in there. And he says, no, you not, you fools, that in one day, the flood came on the earth, and it came on Sodom and Gomorrah, the judgments, and, 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 and the fiery judgments of Yovah are coming on this earth again, and the earth is going to be consumed. I believe he's speaking about the lake of fire there. I don't want to be part of that. If the fire comes on me, I want it to refine me because I'm gold, silver, and precious stones. Not because my life is made up of wood, hay, and stubble. The wood, hay, and stubble is the stuff that we take out of Egypt that we're in harmony and sync with. That's the wood, the hay, and the stubble. And, li and we have to always be in touch with Egypt. We, I mean, we even have to be, have our phones going and, and, and listening and wired in and all the time, Egypt, and, and, and listening to the voices out there. Well, this generates tough. I mean, I got a phone, and people are constantly trying to call you. Clients are trying to call you. In fact, I need to turn mine in case the phone rings. I want it to be on mute. I don't want to hear about the world. I don't need to hear about somebody's tree that needs to be cut down. When can you come and do my job? I don't need to hear about that. I'm not today. And they, they can text message. I don't care. I'm not interested. This is where it's at right now. I don't need to let the, let the, let the people who are hell-bound go to hell. I hope they repent. But they're on the highway to hell unless they repent of their sins and come to Yeshua. And why do I care what they have to say on the Shabbat? I don't care. I want to, I want to hear what he has to say. Hallelujah. So it's time to wake up out of spiritual slumber and get deprogrammed and detuned from the world. It's time to stop dancing to the drumbeat of the world. And we're all struggling. We all have these internal struggles. As he says in Revelation 8, 4, come out, 18 verse 4, come out of her, my people. Come away to me, my love, is the cry of the Song of Solomon. You know, there's a place there in the Song of Solomon. She was tucked neatly in bed. <coughs> it was late at night, she was tired and he's knocking on the door and he's saying, come let's go leap on the mountain tops like a heart, like a deer the pulls are just so strong, aren't they? just can't turn it off and she was in bed and she didn't want to get her feet dirty and go across the floor That's you and me. The comfort zones of our religion or, the, or our nests that we've made in the world with religious trappings. You draw near with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. Like I told a guy the other day, a client. He almost died in the hospital. He's in his late 30s. I've known him before. He's a mechanic. He's worked on my stuff. He was in an induced coma because his pancreas was shutting down. It's because he was a, he was a boozer. And he admitted, he says, I put myself in there because of my alcoholism. And he stopped. He said, I met Jesus in there. I said, really? 
I said, what do you mean you met Jesus? He said, you know, oh yeah, I've known Jesus. But I don't go to church, but I know Jesus. I told him, I says, just because you go sit in a car, in a, it's because you go sit in a garage, that doesn't mean you're a car. Just because you go sit in church doesn't make you a follower of Yeshua. That's what I told him. I said, it's about obedience. I know, it just went over his head. I've witnessed to him before. My heart breaks. You get somebody's on death's door and they're not waking up. I got a sister like that. Someday I pray. Come out of her, my people. The Lord wants us to come and dance with him. Get out of tune. Come into the quietude of the wilderness. Hear his voice. Come out of Egypt. And as I say here in my notes, turn off the television. Take the earbuds out of your ears. Turn off the video games. Turn off the texting. Turn off the mad pursuit of material possessions and head knowledge. Say no to your friends who want to lead you astray. Look, look, they don't know they're trying to lead. They don't know they're leading you astray. They're just following what they normally do. A pig likes to wallow around. Those are, I hate to say, those are pig stalls down there. This barn is, I'll talk about the barn in a minute. They've been cleaned up. But that, those were, that's where they came. Pigs like to wallow around in, in, in you know, in, in pig swill. They do what pigs do. Doesn't mean we have to go out there and be with them and act like them. The world wants you to party with it and do its thing. Doesn't mean we have to do it. We're called to a higher level. Say no to your friends. Or tell your friends, hey, why don't you come to church with me? Come to Shavuot with me. Hey, we're going to be in a barn. Hmm? Church in a barn? I got to go check this thing out. <laughs> hey, you never know. Turn off the sports games and the movies. How much time do you watch TV compared to, and movies compared to how much time you spend in the Bible and in prayer every day? That's Egypt, folks. Yeah, he wants us to get in tune with him. In tune and in harmony with Yehovah Elohim, the fountain of living waters, the divine conductor of the universe. Let's get in sync with that. Let's get in sync and in tune with the heavenly philharmonic. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name. He is near. He is near. He is near. Yeshu Hashem Is near, is near. The 
Yeshua Hashem Behimatzot.